Okay, so we're back and um, we are continuing to look at the series, um, What is Man? Reclaiming the Original Purpose of Humanity on the Earth. Now I've changed scenery a little bit. I'm actually out in my barn. Changed things up a little bit. Um, <laughs> there's this room up in the barn um, on our property. The barn's pretty large and uh, it has this area where they used to hang tobacco to dry. It's an enclosed area. Oh, I don't know, 25 by 15 or so. And uh, it's got a lot of character. I cleaned it out early last summer. Um, just had a bunch of old junk in it. Old random pieces of wood and implements and garbage. And uh, the men here, we started meeting up here for prayer when the weather cooperated and uh, we labeled it the upper room because you have to walk up several steps uh, to get up in it and it overlooks our lower pasture um, which is just a pretty awesome view I have to say but the inter most interesting thing is um, I've set up this little table in here um, my little makeshift podium and uh, with the door open which it is today because it's a beautiful sunny day, although chilly and very windy. And straight in front of my line of sight is the old church, which um, our road is named after. It's Wells Chapel. I've heard varying accounts of the history of the building and uh, people who have gathered there over the years. Right now, it's very seldom used. Uh, a couple times a month at the most. Uh, the pastor's quite old and uh, in not very good health. But I, I can't help but wonder as I'm standing here looking at these things that I'm recording. And, you know, I'm looking at that building and I'm just thinking of all the activities that took place there over the last hundred years, however long that that chapel has been there. And I just wonder... <sighs> I just wonder the history of the church. You know, I like I wonder knowing a little bit where they are now the the congregation that meets there. I mean, we're talking a literal handful of people. Um because around here, I mean, we are literally in the country so much they have somewhat type circuit meetings. Um you'll meet here uh, this little country church one week and another church the next. And, um, you know, just kind of the way they did for sure in the 40s and 50s. Um, it's, very, it's very interesting. It's, it's somewhat sad, I have to say, just because of the disinterest in it um, and just the lack of people involved. I mean, it's really, it's like a small business from the 50s and 60s, which has just kind of waned and no one has interest anymore um, to gather in such a way. There's no frills about it. There's no bathrooms in there. Um, they have electricity. <laughs> um, but it's just a completely different approach to the body of Christ. It's such a an old, and I don't mean this negative at all, but like it's considered outdated, the approach to Christianity that I'm sure at one point probably thrived in those four walls. But everything's changed. Um, Church is big business now. Um, you woo people. You have flash. You have uh, hip culture-driven ideas. And this cool little country church that I'm looking at, it's lost its place. Um, the church of that version of that type has lost her way. Uh, much like this entire area. Uh, most people my age, 45 years old, are, have long since left. Um, family farms are uh, carried on by the preceding generation, and nobody that follows them, for the most part, wants them. Um, they've gone off to big business, nice houses, nice neighborhoods, and their goal was to get out of here. And, uh, you know, our, our goal was, was to get here. Um, to leave the enticements of worldly success and uh, 
entertainment driven living where we're just so constantly driven by the demands of the culture of the world and the patterns they're in that are just exhausting and literally burn up all of our natural and I would then say spiritual resources um, till there's really just not much left for kingdom realities. Um, we have to just say that that's true. I mean, there's no room left. And this church right in front of me is the absolute perfect depiction of that reality. It doesn't have anything flashy. It doesn't have anything that you can squeeze in for an hour on a, an 11 a.m. service. Um, they don't have a praise team. They don't have dramas. And, you know, they don't have all of that stuff. And so there's nobody here. Let's just say it. The gospel as it used to be, is just not enough anymore. It's been forsaken. And I'm not saying that's the epitome of what was right, but I do believe there were things that were right within it because when we moved from Atlanta, oh my, almost 20 years ago, we moved up to rural northeast Georgia to begin to work at a small country church there. There was something there. Um, there was something relational there. Um, they at least, if nothing else, understood the familial relationship um, that I would say has primarily been lost within church culture today. I'm not saying it's completely gone. I'm not saying it's completely vacant, but it has been incrementally in my generation for sure. You just move out of that, and, and the most you have is some coffee and a meeting a week and maybe a home group, um, and sharing events. I mean, that really is the most of, of this culture today. Um, now, obviously, there are pockets of a lot of, you know, smaller type intimate gatherings of people really striving to fill that yearning and longing that they do have and should have, relationally speaking, within Christianity. Um, but most of the case, primarily we have to just admit that there's just really no time left. Um, and the epitome of that is like, I saw something the other day, it was some online ad or something that came across and it was basically saying that for, um, what are those little electronic, uh, echoes? Um, I can't think of the name of, you say the lady's name or whatever and you... She's the genie in the bottle, and she answers all your questions. Whatever the case, that I think it's a dot, echo dot, I don't know. That shows my competence in that area right there. Whatever that thing is, there's some Christian app for that, I guess is what it is. It's some Christian program. Program, oh boy, do I use that loosely. I want to say it was like 90 seconds um, a morning that you you say you know, whatever, you say, Bible study, uh, what's today's Bible study? And, you know, the little gadget responds with, today in John four twenty seven, we are going to look at Jesus teaching the disciples. And, you know, it just goes on. And in every single daily morning thing, if I remember right, was like 90 seconds. Get your 90 seconds of spirituality to, like, order your day and set your day. And I just saw that, and I was so grieved. I wasn't mad. I wasn't, I sure wasn't laughing. But in light of, even as I'm standing here looking at this church and talking about what I am right now, I just, I see those types of things, and I just, I'm just sad. It's just a disappointment that, that the writings of what people like Paul said and the charges that he gave to us on what we must do to enter the kingdom and to even be called according to the name of Christ. Friends, people of the first church, if they saw what we today in 2019 call Christianity, they would either think that we are completely fabricating a story 
and not even give themselves to believe that's true, or they would just be so appalled and offended that we would say that that is Christianity. I think they would be so sad by that reality that that is, in fact, we call it the same thing as they did of being a follower of Christ. And so with that in mind, I'm going to pick back up in the study we're doing. Um, The last thing we looked at, in the beginning, who ruled and who reigned the earth? That was the last part that we did. And um, what I want to look at for this episode is what age are we in? Who rules? And talk about Lucifer's origin just barely. Now this is going to be a lot of scripture reading. I realize I don't do that much, or at least I haven't done that too much in these podcasts. And as I've shared, and I'll continue to for clarity's sake, that's the case because I'm often driving. I I can't, I'm not very good at quoting scripture accurately, and I don't want to just paraphrase and say, well, in 1 Peter, you know, it's kind of saying this. I don't want to be that way, so a lot of times I refrain from quoting scripture. Um, So when I do these that are a little more organized, like I referenced in the introduction, I'm going to try to put a little more spiritual emphasis, scriptural emphasis, um, upon matters. And so I just want to encourage all of us who are listening, and me as I read it, to not just disregard it because, oh, somebody's just reading Bible verses. Um, You know, fight that urge to just not really take in these words. If anything, they're the most valuable component of the entire thing. So let's start with the best part. In Matthew 28, Jesus, right after his resurrection, told his disciples, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Okay, now these are just, these are just some thoughts, really, in regards to who rules, what age are we in, Revelation 12.10. All right, we're going all the way to a culmination of sorts. Everything coming to a close at some point. I'm not going to get into where we are in the Revelation timeline. I don't claim to know, but we have to be able to set these things aside and really really focus on what we do know and what we are told. And so Revelation 12.10 says, Now the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God... And the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of what? Because of the blood of the Lamb. And because of something else. Because of the word of their testimony. And they didn't do something that's so valuable that we could spend days talking about. They overcame him because of the blood and the word. And they didn't love their life even when faced with death. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing he only has a short time. Isaiah speaks of the king of Babylon. I believe, and I, and as do most people, um, that that's... At the very least, a type of Satan in Lucifer's fall. I believe it's just synonymous. And it says, When the Lord will have compassion on Jacob and again choose Israel and settle them in their own land, then strangers will join them and attach themselves to the house of Jacob. The people will take them along and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel will possess them as an inheritance in the land of the Lord." as male and female servants, and they will take their captors captive and will rule over their oppressors. And it will be in the day when the Lord gives you rest from pain and turmoil and harsh service in which you have been enslaved. You will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon, and you will say, How the oppressor has ceased! How fury has ceased! The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of rulers, which used to strike the peoples in fury with unceasing strokes, which subdued the nations in anger with unrestrained persecution. The whole earth 
is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into shouts of joy. Even the cypress trees rejoice over you and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since you were laid low, no tree cutter comes up against us. Sheol from beneath is excited over you to meet you when you come. It arouses for you the spirits of the dead, leaders of the earth, raises all the kings of nations from their thrones. They will all respond and say to you, the oppressor, even you have made weak as we. You have been made weak as we. You have become like us. Your pomp and the music of your harps have been brought down to Sheol, and maggots are spread out as your bed beneath you, and worms are now your covering. Oh, how you have fallen from heaven, star of the morning, son of the dawn, you have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. Those who, you, those who see you will gaze at you. They will ponder over you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms? who made the world like a wilderness and overthrew its cities? End of quote in verse 17 of Revelation chapter 12. We're not told of the when of this prophecy necessarily, but I can't help but wonder, why not live in that reality right now? Why not walk in this reality and understanding? Because we're told back in Revelation 12 that I'm sorry, that last one was Isaiah. Isaiah. Um, I don't want to get confused or confuse you. I went back too far saying that was Revelation 12, but that was in Isaiah. Whatever the case, both of these scriptures, the Revelation 12 one is the one that um, the devil has come down to you. He's a great wrath. He's knowing that he only has a short time. And then it talks about, you know, the one in Isaiah talks about this great closing of that season of that age where people look upon the enemy and say are you the one who did all those things you a proper ordering of the supernatural of the spiritual realities in luke chapter 10 we see jesus appoint and send out 70 individuals in pairs to all the cities that he would end up visiting There's a lot going on. There's obviously always throngs and multitudes of people enamored with Jesus and his works, his signs and wonders. And so Jesus sent these men out, and they would, in a sense, go and prepare the way for his arrival. He gives them plenty of instructions on what they're to do that we don't have time to address here, including, but not limited to, healing the sick and declaring warnings to the people. So these men presumably do that, and they come back, and the scriptures pick up, telling us that these 70 men who went out in pairs return with joy. And they say, quote, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will injure you? And what strikes me as I read this is the place in the timeline. This really stuck with me because my, my thought patterns up until that point had kind of been like post-ascension and post-Pentecost um, when the Holy Spirit actually descended and tongues of fire danced upon men's heads. But at this point, when Jesus told them these things, he had not yet died and rose again. And this may seem random, but I feel like the Lord has brought some clarity and purpose into, into it by aligning it with the establishing of the government of God on the earth. 
And this is the way I understand it. Presently, this second. Now, this one, is, this one could, could change and morph into some other thoughts. And that's okay. The ruling authority that once was, was being reinstated on the earth by the God-man Emmanuel, Jesus, who did not live according to the government of the deceiver. I believe this is why he stated in this discourse, like precisely, I think this is why he referenced Satan's fall. And if we see God's original intent and know his ultimate end, according to Genesis all the way to Revelation, and they are one and the same, which is perfect communion with God and his established order, should we not be laboring now unto instituting and thereby walking in this kingdom reality here and now in what we can call the in-between? We too, I believe, can enter into this reality. So, I think we must examine where everything began and what the present order of the earth actually is in regards to principalities and powers and how regenerated Christ men that have been moved into the lineage of last Adam, Jesus, have we been, whether in ignorance or lack of faith or whatever we want to call it, have we been surrendering dominion to the serpent just as our old man forefathers who were following in the ways of Adam did? Let's look at a couple more verses. 1 John 5, 19. We know that we are of God. The whole world lies in the power of what? The power of who, rather? The evil one. We know that the Son of God has come, and he has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. I think a word that would do us well to think about for the next few moments, and if not completely approaching this as a whole, is distinction. Literally, I remember as I was sitting down writing this a couple weeks ago, uh, my son was in the other room, just down the hall in our uh, living room, and he's playing... Bible CDs. He, he likes to listen to um, the audio reading of the Bible. And he was stuck in Exodus for weeks, like this same disc talking about the plagues and, and uh, everything that had to do with Pharaoh and let my people go. I literally have that, that disc memorized, I believe. Um, but literally, as my fingers are on the laptop typing out the word distinction, Around when I get to the word, the letter N, I hear from the other room in the Exodus reading that God made a distinction. As again, as the book of Exodus is playing, something along the lines, paraphrase, it said, "And the Lord made a distinction, a distinction between the people of Israel and the Egyptians." And I got to thinking about that. I just stopped. I put my hands on my lap, and I just was like, okay, this is probably not just happenstance. Why, as I'm writing this and thinking of this primarily from a New Testament perspective, would I hear the word distinction as I'm typing it coming from the book of Exodus? And so I felt like this might be a good pattern of being in but not of, in the account of the Israelites being protected from God's judgment. Okay, so they, we know the people of Israel had been enslaved. We, we know this, right? But the, when, when the judgment of God came upon the Egyptians, upon the, the world they were within, They were spared. I mean, all the way down to, you know, just just everything that took place. Obviously, we know God's hand was just, (laughs) 
stamped upon them like a signet ring. I mean, they were the set-apart people, even within their arguably just <laughs> horrendous circumstances. We can't even imagine. And we, and we wonder why they grumbled, as if we would be any different. But whatever the case, these people, as they are enslaved and miserable, they were miserable, but they weren't receiving God's judgment that fell upon the Egyptian people as long as they did as God commanded, all the way down to the Passover experiences. If you put the blood on the doorposts, you will not receive the judgment that is not for you. God set them apart. He made a distinction over and over and over and over again. Now, that is encouraging We can make that a little book that sits on your coffee table and we can talk about how exciting that is because God takes care of his children, right? Again, I'm not promoting a doctrine of spiritual immunity. And you know why that is? Because we have to keep reading. We have to keep expanding the story to see it fully. Because we have to remember that the Israelites were slaves, to the country that they were in, right? They were subject to that government in measure. Now, they were preserved from God's judgment, yes. And so I admittedly need to think on this point in greater measure than I have thus far, which has been a good bit, but I've not arrived at anything. Right now, it's in question mark mode. So did Jesus' death and his resurrection free us from the powers of the air and its slavery? Because I'm now in the lineage of the last Adam who instituted a new era of victory on the earth? Because I'm not under the same law as Job was, right? We're in the New Testament now. We're going to look at that in a little bit. I'm going to keep moving on. Paul understood in 2 Corinthians 4 and told us, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In those, excuse me, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. To me, this was the ongoing result of the fall that originated in Adam. Blinded minds, unbelieving, not seeing, deceived. Nothing has changed since Paul's day, surely. He wrote in Romans 5, verse 19, For as by first Adam's disobedience, many were made sinners. So... By the obedience of last Adam, Jesus, shall many be made righteous. A distinction, a transference, a restoration. You once were a disobedient son, and now by the obedience of Jesus, we, the many, shall be made righteous. Colossians 1. Verse 13, for he, Jesus, rescued us from the domain of darkness. Okay? And he did what? He transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. And I would just like to point out, it does not say he rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. He rescued us from the domain We've been moved from, if you look at the word studies on these things and really scrutinize it, when things like that stick out and you have to ask your questions, why does it say that? Why was it worded? And first and foremost, was it really that, the best we can understand? Is that what it really said? We've been moved, if you looked at the original root words, we've been moved from a jurisdiction, authority, and an influence of darkness into a kingdom of his beloved son. And the kingdom is a royal power, a dominion, and a rule. 
We must see this absolutely from a spiritual vantage point. Or else none of this is going to make one bit of sense beyond just our intellect. This is why we must no longer live. This is why we die daily. This is why we join into his death. What if when we see and know foundationally that we are in fact really now seated in heavenly places with Jesus, that we're no longer subject to a yoke of slavery, but we've in fact moved from death to life. Yes, we're presently here on a natural earth, but this theme continues in verse 21 of Colossians 1. Although you were formerly alienated, which is shut out from intimacy and estranged, although you were these things formerly, and you were hostile in mind, and you were engaged in evil deeds, you were a son of Adam, you were subject to slavery, you were, according to the powers of the heirs, kingdoms, and rule, and under their dominion and influence, Yet, in verse 22, he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him, capital H, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven. That is a mouthful. In light of the purpose and origin of man, what is man? The man who is in Christ that was formerly shut out and estranged and hostile and evil has been reconciled and is holy, presented holy and blameless. We must, re- we, must, we must realize that this is who we truly are. It's not something where we squint and grit our teeth enough to just convince ourselves it's some hyper-spirituality truth. This is not word of faithness. This is not wishful thinking. This is the faith of Abraham that says, covenantally speaking, yes, Lord, this is true. And we have to have that. We must unearth this. I'm going to end this here for for now. I've got a lot to go. I hope God makes this clear as you listen and as I speak to me. I hope it's clear and to you who listen. I just believe, I'm just convinced that there is something within this for who is not just a casual believer, but a true pursuer of the kingdom of God. Like in a mature expectation of like free from the emotionalism that normally is attached to these type of topics. I'm in the room of a barn. There's nothing in this emotional. The only people hearing me talk right now other than you through the beauty of electronics are some cattle on this hill. This is no feel-good message to try to win anybody over or to excite anyone. This is just an attempt to step back and whoever is willing to join in with me to say, what is it, Lord? 
What government am I under? Am I within? Even if we think we know, if we think we knew, can we just set that to the side? Whether you're 20 or 70, we have to know these things. And then we have the responsibility to do something about it. And so thanks for listening. I don't know what part we're on. I think I'm going to be doing part three next. Whatever the case, um, we will continue looking at what is man and uh, the original purpose and intent of him on the earth. Uh, Thanks for sticking around.